Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Katmai National Park in Brooks Falls. My name is uh, Mike Fitz, and I am the media ranger for Katmai National Park and Preserve. And my name is Roy Wood. I'm the chief of interpretation for Katmai National Park. Uh, thank you for joining us for our first ranger chat of the year. Uh, we're, we realize we're running a, a little bit late, but uh, it's, you know, it's the first one of the year. We had to get up here to the falls, get everything set up and tested, and, um, and we're just about ready to get started. I'm going to fess up to something here, though, before we do. Normally, we are fed our questions on the iPad. While we were troubleshooting this morning, the iPad was sitting here in the sun, and now the iPad is too hot. <laughs> so it's making me let it cool down before it will feed me questions. But you can go ahead. You can start asking your questions, and as soon as we're able to receive them, we'll uh, start trying to answer them. First thing we wanted to do today was to uh, talk, however, just about the falls in general. Uh, give you a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, the basic background on what happens here at the falls every year. And, and um, then we'll jump into some of the user or viewer questions. And, and that might include some updates on the bears that have been seen and, and goings on around here, both on and off camera that we've observed. Right now at Brooks Falls, I think this is a really exciting year or time of the year to watch. Uh, the, the falls can because there can be a lot of stuff going on right now. We haven't seen really huge numbers of fish moving into Brooks River, but a lot of bears know that this is the time of the year where they want to go down and they want to try to catch some fish at Brooks Falls. So we're seeing different bears showing up all the time. They'll wander into Brooks Falls and see if there are some fish there. They'll wander out. But throughout the next couple of weeks or so, we're going to see increasing numbers of bears at Brooks Falls. And maybe we should talk about why Brooks Falls is such an important place for, for bears. Uh, because really, when you think about it, none of these bears have had a good salmon meal since last last October. Right. The bears that are catching the fish right now, those are really their, probably their first high-calorie foods that they've had since last fall. So they're starting to prepare for the winter already, and Brooks Falls is probably the first place that they can do it. And why is this place such a good spot for it? Um, in, it's in part because Bristol Bay has the largest run of wild sockeye salmon on the planet. And so we've got millions and millions of fish coursing into this system every year. A small fraction of those will peel off from the main school, head up the Naknek River, cross Naknek Lake, and come into Brooks River, which is uh, the river that's directly behind us. And the first real obstacle they run into, those salmon, as they're, they're heading up the the river is this fall right here. I mean, yeah, there's some, you know, there's predators along the way, there's the floating bridge down at the lower river, but this, this is a pretty substantial barrier to, to fish. The falls are, are almost six feet tall, and uh, that's quite a jump that those fish have to make. And what, what it means to the bears is that those fish will pile up downstream from the falls and, and, and rest a little bit before making that uh, attempt to jump the falls and, and, and hopefully clear it and not, at least from the salmon perspective, hopefully clear it and not land into the, uh, the mouth of a bear. Of course, the bears have different plans for, for the use of the falls. And when you're watching the bears, the bears are looking to take advantage of the mistakes that salmon happened to make. The, the salmon, they encountered the falls when they ran out to sea uh, probably four or five years ago, but it was probably only once. They probably just fell over it and then they kept <laughs> on going. So they weren't investigating how am I going to get back up uh, Brooks Falls when I come back in a few years. Uh, so the salmon are trying different places along the falls. They may swim to the far side and get caught in some of the shallows over there. They may get turned over in the jacuzzi, which is the plunge pool uh, that's fairly close to where the cam actually sits. And when the bears are sitting in those positions, they're taking advantage of the disorientation that maybe the fish are experiencing in the water. Uh, they're also, the bears are very quick predators, um, so they can pounce on the fish. They'll see them sometimes chasing them through the water. Downstream, we'll sometimes see bears fishing as well, but the bears downstream of Brooks Falls have to work a little bit harder to catch those fish. Uh, they're going to try to work the least amount possible, of course, and that's right. something that we always talk about on the cams is look at the bears' different fishing styles at Brooks Falls because that'll tell you a lot about uh, just how successful they're going to be, why they're fishing in certain places. Sometimes a bear will sit there for hours and it looks like it's not catching anything, but that's a, a Actually, when you think about it from an energy standpoint, that's a pretty successful strategy. Yep. Yep. Do you want to um, go ahead and try to uh, yeah, log into the iPad? Then I can yeah. see them qu the questions as they come in, too. Yeah. Um, we actually had one of the questions, since we're kind of on fish, Okay. Um, we probably want to talk about a little bit of other things associated with the, the general aspects of Brooks Falls. But um, one of the questions associated with fish is how long does it take the salmon to get here? From, this, from the Bering Sea, from Bristol Bay. And it's about 60 water miles. And we think it gets 
or it takes in and maybe a couple days to get here. We're not really quite sure of that. I mean, we'd have to tag the fish and then look for the fish to get here. Uh, but that's our best estimate, I think, right now. It's about uh, 60 miles and a couple of days to get here. Right. So what was the question that you were, you said there were some fish questions. I guess we could just jump into that and the, uh, if there yeah. was a good fish question. So another one about, about fish is when a, uh, when a bear gorges on salmon one day, will they skip eating the next day or will they keep on stuffing themselves again? That's one of the things that I uh, find sort of interesting about uh, Brooks Falls in July is you will see the bears gorging for periods of time and then there may be no salmon the next day. The availability of fish, they're probably going to go, if they're full, they're going to go into the forest, maybe take a nap, <laughs> maybe come back and fish a little bit later. But the very next day, they're going to be looking for more salmon. Right, because it's it's uh, it's not about what a human would consider to be a healthy diet right now. It's all about you know getting fat. It's trying to eat the fattiest foods and as much as your body can possibly handle. And uh, as Mike said, they'll they'll eat and eat and eat till they're full, and then many of them will just leave and go off into the to the forest to to sleep. Uh, I, when you said that, though, I got a little smile on my face because I was thinking of 410, who sometimes doesn't make it to the forest. She maybe <laughs> just goes barely across the river and then just drops and goes to sleep uh, kind of up in, in this area, just downriver from the falls. And uh, we'll see her on the cam sometimes sleeping just right at the water's edge. But uh, for the most part, the bears will leave the river corridor, go off into the forest a short distance and take a nap. And that leads to this issue that we sometimes see around here when the, the fish are very numerous. If there are a hundred fish jumping the falls per minute, and you can count them, you can just see them popping like popcorn. When that's happening, uh, bears are very successful at catching fish, which means they might fill up very quickly on fish. And you know, you just can only put so many fish in your belly at any one time. And so, if they're super successful, they're going to fill up and they're going to leave, and you're not going to see as many bears fishing the falls. And, and so from a bear watching standpoint, what you've got to hope for is sort of this sweet spot where there's just enough fish to keep the bears interested, but not so many fish that they just fill up and gorge themselves and then leave for, you know, half a day. And right now, I think we're, you know, because we're, we're still at the early part of the run, we're seeing, you know, more bears having to spend more time fishing than, um, than just eating and being successful and going and sleeping. Conversely, if there's no fish around, then they may not stick around for yeah, they'll lose interest. more period of time and, yeah, and they'll yep. lose interest and they'll leave. Uh, when you are watching the cams, it can be very interesting to count how many fish some of these bears can eat. And just the other day we had uh, a, good, a decent number of fish up at Brooks Falls, I wouldn't say huge numbers, and there was one fish or one bear who's really dominant, number 856, uh, and he likes to fish in the jacuzzi. He's excellent at fishing in the jacuzzi, really skilled at that spot, very practiced. And I saw him over, I think, the course of two hours catch and eat 14 salmon. And he ate, completely ate the first seven of them. <laughs> and then the, the rest of them he was kind of picking maybe some of the choicier part, um, parts of the fish. But he was eating, uh, per fish, about 4,500 calories. Uh, so in the first 10 fish that he took in, I mean, he was taking in 40,000 calories. And he ate, the, he caught the first 10 fish, I think, within... Uh, within a half hour or something like that. So, I mean, he was taking in an incredible amount of food. And this all boils down to their uh, their adaptations that allow them to survive the winter famine. What they're doing right now that, and, and the feast that they're looking for, that is to survive the winter famine. So when you're looking at their behavior and you're trying to figure out what they're doing at Brooks Falls, again, it does boil down to a few things. It boils down to uh, survival uh, for the for the winter time. And then there's also some interesting behavior going on right now too that has a lot to do with biology and that happens to be well, sex. Mm -hmm. This is the mating season for bears yep. too. Maybe uh, we can transition into that topic sure. as well. Uh, yeah, the, you know, when the when the bears show up in the spring, the, f the first bears we see tend to be ones just um, shuffling around looking for scraps of food to eat, maybe eating the, the first bits of vegetation that are starting to grow. But that behavior is quickly uh, supplanted by one of, of courtship. And uh, then what we start to see are courting pairs of bears moving through the area. And it's not always obvious the first time you see them that they're courting because there might just be two bears moving together and you think, 
well, that's interesting. Why are those two bears moving together? And you start to investigate a little closer and you'll see that it's a male and a female. And courtship can take a week or more in some cases. And during that, that possibly extended courtship period, what is happening is the female is leading the male on a usually slow paced chase around Brooks Camp. They'll go down the river, up the river, they'll cut through the cabin area, they'll go out on the beach, they'll walk all the way past the campground, they'll turn around, they'll come back. And um, this this really can go on for a long, long time. And and eventually they get closer together and um, maybe stopping every now and then for, for some eating of, of vegetation or, or in the case of like the last week or so, maybe a fish or two. And then back to this slow speed chase again. Eventually, after you know hours to days to maybe weeks of this, uh, the the two will will couple and. Um uh, sometimes it's it, it's an extended period. What we had like 45 minutes on camera, like below the yeah, falls last hour, year. Minutes, yeah, some sometimes. some pretty long ones. Sometimes um, periods where they're together, but um, that's that's really the extent. The male might stay around for a little while to to hopefully ensure that another male doesn't come in and also mate with the female, because she can have multiple fathers in a in a litter of cubs because she can ovulate again, and um, but after after the courtship is over and after the mating is over the the male bear pay, plays no part in the in the rearing of the young or the providing of food for the female while she, while she's pregnant it's a it's a very different uh uh, you know, a bit of animal behavior than, than some other mammals might have, like wolves, where we, you know the pack helps take care of the offspring. And it's common if uh, for people who are maybe watching bears for the first time to confuse these courting pairs with uh, a, a female and a cub because the males are so much larger than the females. Right. Males can weigh one half to, uh, or excuse me, females can weigh uh, one one third to one half less than an adult male. So we may have a really big adult male at the falls, someone like 747 or 856 who weighs 800 pounds at this time of the year, and then a female that may run about 400 pounds, 500 pounds at, at the biggest. Uh, and then sometimes you'll see much smaller females being escorted, so to speak, by a really big male. So when you're seeing two different sized bears, it's not always a mom and cubs. It could be uh, a male following a female. So, so if you can't go by size alone, how do you tell the difference on the cams between a male and a female? Well, sometimes you can look for the important parts, I like to say. You can look for the genitalia on the bears. On the cams, it might be a little hard to tease out those really small details. Even here along along the river, oftentimes Roy and I have difficulty actually seeing. We look for uh, them peeing a lot of times. Yep. We focus a lot on that, yeah, it seems like. The urination <laughs> pattern is definitely uh, an easier way on the cams to tell a male from a female bear. A males will pee straight down between their hind legs. Females will pee out behind them. So that's an easy way to differentiate between the two. And with cubs, it's probably the only way right. you're gonna be able to tell. If you're here, you can sometimes pick out uh, differences in in um, you know bone structure, massiveness of, of like the neck uh, to indicate that it, that it's a male versus a female, but that doesn't always hold true. And you know, 410 is a great example of a very massive, big-boned female that people often uh, confuse with a male. And I don't know if we can see it yet. It looks like maybe it's just appeared, and there's a bear right behind us, over your left shoulder. Yeah, it's. Uh yeah, walking right behind us. So yeah, it's probably going to go in one of our ears. That happens sometimes when we've got animals behind us. It happened, yeah. With me with it, the, the salmon. salmon. He puts so creatures in I our had, ears, I, I always. had fish in the brains last year in one of our, <laughs> one of our videos. Uh, so, yeah, the, um, look for um, males following females. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that a biology professor told me, probably the thing that stuck with me the most uh, from my, my college days, was that almost all of biology boils down to food and sex. If you want to be, uh, you want to eat so you can survive, and you want to eat so you be re reproductively fit, and then you want to pass on your genes. I mean, they're all, almost all ant behavior of, of animals and plants sort of boils down to that. So when you're watching the bears, a lot of times you can kind of tease out these, uh, you know, these really nuanced behaviors of them, but it may just boil back to those two simple facts: yep. food, uh, and sex. Yep. Um, Speaking of food again, uh, one of the viewers has asked a question about should we be concerned about the fact that there aren't salmon jumping at the falls right now? And um, no, we're still very early in the in the run of salmon. Uh, on the way up here, we were discussing the um, the the number of salmon that so far that have made it up the river. 
Um, and and uh, I've forgotten what Mike said. Mike checked, I didn't check. What were the numbers of uh, the escapement up the Naknek River? Yeah, so up the Naknek River, we're uh, closer to 150,000, 200,000 fish, I think, right now. If I remember correctly, you can go to the Alaska Department of Fish and Games website and, yep. uh, and check the, the updated numbers. I'm sure someone can drop it into the comment section, uh, that link, because I've posted it a, a, a few times on there. So the day before yesterday, I think there were about 70,000 fish that entered the Naknek River. And Brooks River typically gets about 20% of those fish. So if we have 100,000 fish, then we're going to have uh, you know maybe 20,000 fish coming up the Brooks River. And when they get to the falls, that's a, like we were talking about before, that's a significant barrier to the salmon. Yep. And I think it takes multiple leaps for them to actually make it up Brooks Falls. I, uh, when I'm up here watching bears, one of the things that I often like to do is count the number of fish jumping and the number of fish that actually make it. And over the past couple of years or so, counting uh, over several hours and counting uh, you know, throughout the month of July and thousands of fish over that period of time, I think it's around 7 to 9% of the fish actually make it, make the leap. So I think it takes them many times to get up and over Brooks Falls because in, in some years we can have 200,000 fish going not just into Brooks River but through Brooks River and into Lake Brooks and the tributaries that surround Lake, Lake Brooks. And just to clarify, you said between 7 and 9%. Percent. Yeah, not 79%. Not 79%. Yep. 7 to 9%. Okay, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, just sometimes it's, I know we're a little hard to hear, and I wanted to make sure that we were clear that that's a really low number that, that actually make it. Um, that might lead some of you to think, well then, is this is the falls a bad thing for the salmon? You know, should there be a fish ladder around it? Should some attempts be made to get the fish to the other side more readily? And that was a, a concern um, back uh, about 60 years ago uh, by, by the territory of Alaska, uh, and they they. Uh, there was a fish ladder that was put in. Um, it was the park was still here, but this fish ladder was put in before we really understood that obstacles such as Brooks Falls that are uh, passable with some effort by the fish actually do improve the overall vigor and genetic diversity of that that stock of salmon. So now. Uh, a, a barrier like Brooks Falls would be perceived as being, uh, you know, a, a good feature of the river because of it increasing the the vigor of this of this stock, um, and so we would not be putting in a fish ladder or artificially trucking fish to the other side, uh, at least with the current conditions that we have. Uh, there is a fish ladder there. You can see it in the falls cam a lot of times. It, it enters the, the picture from the left, and there are some bears that do fish the very base of that, but it's blocked off at the top. So no fish, fish or virtually no fish can make it up the fish ladder to the other side. So they do need to jump, and there is currently no way that they can sneak by uh, without you know a bear seeing them or us seeing them try to jump it. They, they've got to they've got to make that leap. And it may actually that. Uh have with the impassable fish ladder that may actually be a, of a benefit to the bears because in prior years the fish many of them would just sneak by <laughs> and we hardly ever saw curiously enough we hardly ever saw bears really fishing the fish ladder right it was, it's kind of hard to see that area anyway because there's so much vegetation in in the way but we just didn't see a lot of bears hanging around that spot so it may it, for whatever reason it was a tough place for bears to fish and now when we have these pulses of of salmon moving into Brooks River, uh, the bears can really gorge for periods of time when the salmon are stacked, stacked up at the falls. And when you're watching the camp throughout the month of July too, don't expect to see uh, consistent numbers of salmon at Brooks Falls. They don't seem to really move through the river at any one point in the day versus another, although maybe sometimes more active in the evening from what I've seen, but I'm not up here throughout the day as much as I would like to um, to really get a firm grasp on what time of the day is best for them to move through the river. And then they also don't enter the Naknek River and this whole watershed at the same time. The commercial fishing may intercept some of the fish and when they don't have commercial fishing open, when they have a closed period to allow fish to escape into the Naknek River, a lot of the fish enter on high tides in the, the Naknek River. So we yeah, have there's a pulse that comes through. Of fish coming through here. So we may see 20,000 fish surge in the Brooks River at a period of time, and then the next day see absolutely none, like we've seen for the past couple of days here. Yep. 
Um, so what we've talked about so far is pretty much the July behavior, where the, the salmon are coming in from Bristol Bay, they head up the river, they stack up here at the falls, the bears wait, pick at them um, as, the, as the bears continue to move through. By the end of July, the, the main, main pulse of those uh, fish that are, that are coming into this river system will have moved through. There'll still be some hanging around here, but as, as the density of fish moves past this area and it sort of stabilizes here, we'll start to see the bears disappear. Um, for the most part, August, there are no bears around Brooks Camp. Yeah, we might see you know, one or two here or there, and there have been some years where a few bears like Ted have stayed at the falls or the lower river for much of August. But for the most part, the 50 or more bears that, that show up in July dissipate and go someplace else. Uh, in some cases, what they're doing is they are following that main wave of fish that has moved through this system to other streams. Uh, they might head up into Lake Brooks and go to some of the tributaries that feed Lake Brooks, uh, or they may leave this drainage entirely and go to other drainages like Margo Creek. Uh, they might go to the Savanoski River, but they will dissipate and go to other salmon spawning areas, or they might just uh, go into their favorite berry patch and eat watermelon berries and blueberries and cranberries and, and crowberries for, for much of August. Um, we don't know specifically where individual bears from here go. However, when we spend time in some of these other places, we do recognize some of the bears that we recognize from this river. And people, you know, that was a little bit about time of the year and when the best time of the year to watch bears is around here. But people are also wondering, what about the time of the day? When mm -hmm. is the best time of the day to watch bears? And bears can be active throughout, well, throughout the day, throughout the night. Uh, it, it seems like early morning along the Brooks River, uh, bears may be a little bit less active. They do tend to uh, sleep during, during the night, although some bears will fish at Brooks Falls even in the middle of the night. Even in September when it's pitch black here, sometimes we'll hear bears in the river. And that's kind of a creepy experience because we can't see them at all. And, and within a day or so, we should have the um, night vision going on the falls. So once it gets really dark here about, uh, you know, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, and when I say really dark, it's still... It's still not pitch black this time of the year, but dark enough that uh, you wouldn't be comfortable out walking around here. We have infrared illuminators at the falls that will kick in, and we should be able to continue to watch the bears at, at the falls like we did last year. So yeah, short answer, uh, bears are active throughout the day. You may want to try to check uh, more towards the evening hours, uh, Alaska time, to see uh, some activity at Brooks Falls, because at night, a lot of times there could be some really good activity up, up at Brooks Falls. Uh, but they're active uh, throughout the day. Uh, net, you know, if you're on the East Coast or in Europe, it might be a little bit hard to try to watch the cams at, at 9 p.m. Alaska time. But uh, some, you know, adjust your sleep schedule. You know, this <laughs> right is a short window. You gotta, you gotta take advantage. Yeah, of the way you that's can. what coffee is for. And <laughs> um, so that um, that answers the question about the time of the day and what happens to the bears when they leave here in July. But as many of you know, if you've been watching this for the, the last three years or so, that um, when, um, when the bears leave in August, many of them do come back in September. And the reason they're coming back in September is that the fish that have entered this system in order to spawn generally do so all at about the same time in, in early September. So there's a, there's a period of time there, three weeks or so, four weeks, where, where the fish that arrive generally in July finally come around to the act of actually spawning. And when salmon spawn, they die. And that, that death or near death of, of those salmon is what draws the, the bears back to this area. Because as you might imagine, catching a live salmon can be fairly difficult, even if there are lots and lots of them stacked in the jacuzzi and you can't move your legs without bumping into them, it still can be difficult to catch them. However, when those very same salmon are dead and or dying, they become much, much easier. And uh, that period in September when those fish are dying is what draws many of these bears back for a really easy month and a half or so of, of feeding where they hardly even have to move. You'll see them just laying at the water's edge, sitting at the water's edge, just raking salmon in and, and eating them. And, and um, they can really put on quite a bit of extra weight at that, that critical time in September, just before going off to their dens for hibernation. They try to eat as many fish as they can right now because these fish are extremely rich in calories. Uh, an average sockeye salmon going to the falls may contain about 4,500 calories but they don't eat once they re-enter fresh water. So they're, for the next couple of months, they're going to be expending incredible amounts of energy 
without eating, their bodies are going to deteriorate just like uh, mine would, like Roy's would if we just stopped eating uh, for that, that period of time. So by the time they're done spawning and they begin to die, the salmon will probably will be uh, contain about half the amount of calories. So the bears don't have to work as hard in, in, in uh, September or October maybe to get those, those fish, but they're maybe not getting as many as many fish uh, or as many calories uh, per fish at that time of the year. So the dynamic definitely just changed from July uh, to to September. And, and there, there was the other question I think that we had um, you know in our queue here is. Uh, somebody was wondering about the, the health of the bears at this yep. time of the year. A lot of them are really looking pretty fat, looking pretty healthy right now. Uh, and that fat that they that they have on their bodies, sometimes you'll see it on their haunches as they're waddling down through the <laughs> river. That fat is what they gained last year. That is not fat that they gained this spring. So again, the bears are eating not only for the winter time, but they're also eating for the springtime as well. Springtime is a really hard time of the year for many bears because there's just virtually nothing to eat. Yeah, there's, there's new grass, new vegetation to eat, but it doesn't really help you build those fat reserves. It just, uh, you know, staves off hunger a little bit, maybe maybe just gives you the sensation of being full because you got a bunch of grass in there, but it's it's nowhere nearly as nutritious as having a, a salmon. And um, But yeah, the, the viewers that are pointing out that, that they look pretty healthy, um, I think, you know, they're right. What I've noticed in some of the bears that have come back that normally I expect to be a little bit thinner are really pretty heavy this year. I mean, 747 is a monster still. Um, and he's actually, you see, oh, Popeye is pretty big too. I yeah. think those are the only two uh, large males that I've seen close enough to really admire their jiggly fat haunches. Yeah, you know, <laughs> a lot of the really big adult males that I've seen so far at Brooks Falls have lo looked fairly healthy from a weight perspective. Uh, some of them are covered in battle scars. Uh, yeah. So you'll see number 83, for instance, has like a big pocket right on the top of its hips. Makes them pretty distinctive. Uh, 814, who uh, people pay attention to uh, on the cams, he's nicknamed Lurch. He's been a, kind of a cam uh, favorite for a few years. Is favorite like a villain. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think people have like a Darth Vader you know. favorite. <laughs> but he uh, he's missing an ear right now. Uh, so he got in a fight. No one observed it. No one really knows the circumstances behind that. But he is missing an ear. So you'll see adult males at this time of the year carrying a lot of wounds, a lot of scars. But weight-wise, they do look uh, look fairly healthy. We haven't got um, kind of a part of that question too. Was you know have there been reports of other bears fishing at different streams in the area? And I haven't heard of any reports. I don't know if you have. This time of year, there's really no other salmon yeah. streams where they can catch fish. Yeah, this is essentially the first in this area. Um, you know, some of you might remember um, last year when when Divot was seen with. Uh, with the wire wolf snare around her neck that uh, when we ended up catching her we caught her at another stream uh, where there were some salmon running but that was that was uh, early August and that was only for like a couple of days that the salmon were even in that lower part of the river they quickly moved through here through there this is the first spot where a significant number of salmon show up and at least in this part of the park and so this is the primary spot they're chasing each other back there. Um, Mike, had, have you done anything about the temperature? Have you um, have you gone in there and, and checked? Because no, I, I certainly haven't. I haven't and checked this year. Well, when I've gone swimming, it's been cold. Uh, so, yeah, I can think we could say it's probably about 50 degrees or so. I don't think it gets much warmer than that, but I haven't actually stuck a thermometer in. And, and we monitor the stream temperatures because uh, the, the people that look for long-term trends, uh, you know, for climate change uh, indications and, and just general knowledge about the, the baseline conditions of the park, they do monitor the, the water quality, which includes temperature of, of most of our major bodies of water around here, including Brooks River. The, the problem, if you will, with those uh, monitoring solutions is that those, those uh, data loggers don't report out real time. They sit in the in the river recording nearly constantly the um, the conditions of the water, and they get retrieved at the end of the season, and then the data gets downloaded. So the only way we know is if we take a thermometer and go out there and go for a swim in it ourselves. But it's cold. Suffice to say, it's it's very cold. However, if you're a bear, 
and you've got this mass that you've got, and not just fat, you know, not just the blubber thing, but even if it's just muscle and hair, uh, you might actually enjoy that 50 degree temperature as opposed to sitting up here in the sun where even right now I'm getting a little hot sometimes. I don't know how Mike can stand it with his insulating layers on here. Impervious. He's just impervious to pain and discomfort. Um, but the, the river is cool. Uh, the, the, the coolness is, um, is sometimes a benefit for the bears, uh, especially when we were having the, the record highs that we were having a couple of weeks ago where it was in the 80s. You know, the, the, the bears definitely would have benefited from that cold water. And you'll sometimes see the courting pairs of bears. Uh, they, you know, when they're following one another and the female doesn't really want to be near the adult male, she'll lead him on this sort of extended chase for hours through the forest when they get to the river sometimes you'll see them just sit in the water just lay down like oh this this feels good so i'm sure they're experiencing when they're really hot and they're running through the forest they're probably experiencing some level of comfort by getting into the cool water were just, you on the beach that time that um i can't remember which couple it was where they were doing like laps after lap after lap down the beach cutting back through camp running and this went on for like an hour like really fast paced and it was it was not a hot day but eventually the male just said enough is enough and went into the river and sat to about like this depth and you could see i won't call it steam because he wasn't boiling but you could see the water vapor just evaporating off of him uh, and it looked like he was on fire and really needed to get in the water and cool down i don't know if that bear's visible but there is soon to be a, a bear that yeah, Perhaps and, cutting. Um, I don't know if it was visible on the cam, but I know people were commenting, um, people standing next to us on our, on the wildlife human platform here, were commenting about bears following one another. And if that could, I didn't look, but that could have been a courting pair. And that, that maybe leads into some of our questions about um, delayed implantation and the gestation period for bears. We actually haven't seen any uh, cubs of the year yet, or spring cubs, newborn cubs that were born this past winter yet. But the bears that are uh, mate, when they mate right now, uh, the egg may be fertilized uh, in the in the in the uterus of the female, but it's not going to implant into her uterus or into her uterine wall until she goes to her den. So the egg will actually just divide a few times, become a blastocyst, and then just float around in there in a the state of arrested development until she goes to her den. And the fat that she carries, just how big she get or how, how big her litter is. Yep. Uh, over the course of the winter. And people are also wondering, of course, when are bear cubs born? Um, for the most part, it's believed that in, in this part of the world, um, you know, in Katmai, the bear cubs are born uh, mid to late January, maybe early February. It's definitely a winter birth, and uh, the female will, um, you know, wake up or barely wake up for it. It's not a it's not an arduous uh, process for, for bears like it is for, for human females, because at birth, that you know, 800-pound female uh, will have about a one-pound cub, little tiny, tiny cub. So it's it's relatively easy to give birth to that that cub, uh, and it will uh, move its way up to one of her teats and begin nursing, you know, immediately and begin growing and growing and growing. Uh, that's what occurs in in uh, you know winter time and uh, she will exit the dens. And the dens in, in this part of the world tend to be on mountains, and we can't see any of the mountains because of the way we framed it here. But above here, uh, just a little bit out of frame is uh, Dumpling Mountain, which is one of the uh, locations in, in this part of Katmai where a number of bear dens can be seen every year. And uh, along those lines too, uh, you know, look for, look for spring cubs at this time of the year. Um, we should expect them to show up every day and to see the, the playfulness of them and also the risk they face is um, uh, an experience that you can have on the camps as well. Cubs are always the center of attention uh, for people who are visiting Brooks River and Brooks Camp and I think they're always going to be the center of attention for people who happen to be watching uh, Brooks Falls. But maybe we should uh, reintroduce ourselves. Oh, that's what about, I was going to say, we're at the halfway, halfway point. Um, we want to thank you for joining us. We are at about the halfway point. My name is Roy Wood, and I am the Chief of Interpretation for Katmai National Park and Preserve. And my name is Mike Fitz, and I'm the Media Ranger for Katmai National Park and Preserve. And if you did just join us sometime after our introduction, uh, what we're doing at this point is we're uh, attempting to answer uh, as many of the viewer questions uh, as possible within the next uh, half hour or so. Uh, 
if you can go to explore.org's webpage and scroll to the bottom of the main page where you're viewing the bears, you'll see uh, a chat area. You can post your questions in there. You can also um, post them on Twitter with hashtag BearCam. And someone at explore.org, and uh, we've sort of switched back and forth. It's either Courtney or Rick, or maybe both of them right now. Um, they are looking over the questions, and then they are feeding us questions via Skype to an iPad and a laptop over here. And we'll, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible within the hour that we have. Uh, if we don't get to your questions we, uh, that, that are posed to us here, we do try to get on the chat board after the, the chat sometime today and try to answer them. So you can um, maybe follow up with this later this afternoon afternoon or this evening and um, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible this being our first chat of the year I don't know how many people are out actually out there watching um, sometimes we have far more questions rolling in than we could ever hope to answer the two of us and if that's the case right now and we don't get to your question we are truly sorry but you can um, you can post it again the next time or uh, even outside of normal ch uh, chats like this Mike or I tend to uh, or Tess will will be checking in on the cam and uh, we will try to answer your questions um, as time allows, even outside of a chat window like this. And some of the questions that we've received uh, more recently in our queue have been about population trends and environmental factors that happen to affect bears. Bears are, I think, what I've experienced and read about, uh, they, they are very adaptable animals. Uh, there are certainly factors that can affect their rates of survival, their uh, rates of, of fertility and reproductive success. Perhaps they're not necessarily the, the poster child though for, for climate change because they are so adaptable. Right. If, you know, uh, there's no salmon here in Brooks River, maybe they can try to go somewhere else. But really does affect the bears overall and their overall population numbers happens to be the salmon. Without salmon, Katmai is an impoverished ecosystem. I think that maybe is the most succinct way that I can say that. We uh, need salmon here to have high concentrations of brown bears. Uh, the numbers of eagles along the river happen to increase when the salmon are here. Other scavengers increase like gulls and magpies. Uh, wolves will fish for salmon on the Alaska Peninsula. And there's a video on our YouTube channel of a wolf fishing right at Brooks Falls next to the bears. So the salmon are the keystone of this ecosystem and uh, climate change may have more direct impacts on salmon habitat and uh, their productivity uh, and survival rates out in the open ocean more than anything else. Over the past several years, we've seen a slight decrease in bear numbers along Brooks River. We don't really know why, no. uh, but it could be maybe more than anything else, more closely tied to abundances of salmon along Brooks River. And most, you know, many predators, I shouldn't say most or all, because I, I, I don't have at my, my, my ready the data to back up exactly what I'm about to say. But there are fluctuations in, in all populations of, of critters if you look at them over a long enough period of time. And sometimes the ups and downs of a population are tied very closely to uh, their uh, th they're either prey or the animal that, that predates on them, you know, like uh, lynx and snowshoe hare. They will go up and down together, and the caribou will go up and down in relation to the health of the tundra where they're feeding. And there may be something like that happening here uh, with, with the salmon. It may be another bear coming up here right underneath us. Oh, okay. I wish you guys could see this, but uh, there's with the railing, there's probably no way the animal that, that predates on them, you know, like uh, lynx and snowshoe hair they will go up and down together and the caribou will go up and down in relation to the health of the tundra where they're feeding and there may be something like that happening here uh, with with the salmon it may be another bear coming up here right underneath us oh, okay. I wish you guys could see this but uh, there's with the railing there's probably no way to see we got 747 it, it, it's one of the amazing experiences I think that people have here at Brooks River is that when you're standing on these wildlife viewing platforms, walking through the forest, bears are right there with you. And this is not a zoo. It, it, it's, it can kind of feel like it maybe if you're on these elevated walkways that we're standing on right now. But these are big, wild animals surrounding us. Um, living in my cabin, I see bears walking right in front of my windows sometimes. Yep. Uh, and I don't try to draw attention to myself in this, <laughs> in this situation. Just let the bear uh, walk on by. But yeah, this is an amazing place uh, because we have these opportunities to really get, uh, see these bears in a way. Uh, to sub-adults, 
to adult bears. We see them growing into very dominant bears. Uh, we get to see them raising their own cubs along the river. And then we get to see sometimes the, uh, the suffering that they go through as they age and they can't compete as well for, for fish along the river. For, for me, that's been one of the more surprising things to me over my tenure here is how much fun it has been to watch a cub become a sub-adult, become an adult, you know, and, and, and mate and and um, and have cubs. So, so it's, I, I didn't expect that. I expected like the, you know, with my geology background, this cold, you know, rocks don't have feelings, rocks don't have emotions, uh, that, that, I'm, that I might be able to extend that uh, to the to the bear but the bears really do at least get to me in the ways that other resources don't and I think it's because I'm able to see them day in and day out and, and really get to see the different personalities and and behaviors it's you know it's been quite fun and we get to see these animals as, as individuals which I think makes bear viewing along Brooks River fairly unique again so if you're new to the cams try to get to know some of the bears we have a bear identification book that you can download off of Katmai's website that's www.nps.gov slash KETM. Look for the, uh, the ebook section and you can download uh, the Bears of Brooks River for 2015, the newest edition. Most of our commonly seen bears are, are in that book. There's a lot of other information about brown bears in Katmai and Brooks River in there as well too. And we really like to follow the stories of these individual right. animals. These are not pets to us. We do not care for them in any way. We don't give them any veterinary care. We do not feed them if they're not getting enough fish. So these are wild animals doing wild things, living in a, in, in a violent and competitive world. Uh, and we can see how they're surviving in, this, in, in, in that world. Uh, we can get to know some bears like number 89, Backpack, who was here this morning, who as a yearling cub uh, seemed to have a broken leg. And people thought we should capture him and put him in a zoo, but now he's an adult bear. Or euthanize here. him was yeah. the other one, to do the, the, you know, the humane thing and euthanize him so he wasn't suffering. And we have other bears here this year who are suffering uh, through big wounds on their bodies, like number 83, who has that, that big flap of skin missing off of the back of his hips. Uh, Lurch, who's missing the ear off of his, uh, off of his head. Uh, so we can get to know the stories of these animals, and I think that's one of the things that really makes bear watching along the Brooks River a, a fascinating experience for myself and everyone who happens to come here. There has not been a question that has come in for a few minutes. Well, we had a, a few about, um, let's see here, injuries, um, any new cubs, and... Oh, now I've got, yeah, so... Yeah, maybe so do, do bears here. possess a powerful antibody? Um, well, I think that the ability of bears to sustain these what would be life-threatening injuries for for Mike and I uh, to, to you know to to receive them and to heal from them is one of the amazing aspects of, of bears and there are uh, scientists in several laboratories around the world that are looking at these various uh, abilities that bears have whether it's the ability to go into hibernation and not eat not drink barely move for months and months and months at a time yet come out of that with muscle mass intact bone density intact uh, internal organs still functioning you know so there, there are people looking at that there are people that look at the ability to fight off infections we see some nasty nasty infections here um, where there's a wound and it's you know it's not quite exposed to the air completely so it, it, it gets infected and uh, you'll see insects you know flies walking on it the bears rolling in the dirt the bears in this this river water which can be just you know packed I'm sure with with um, with feces during certain times of the year from all the bears that are in it they get infected yet in most cases they they fend off that infection and while I can't say because I don't recall ever reading this that they have some amazing antibody there you know I know that there are scientists that are studying that uh, have you read any I have anything and, on and that I actually I think I need to maybe dive deeper into the some of the scientific literature to, to see if anyone has uh, found any information on that so I can't say what we do know is that they have a remarkable ability to heal. Uh, yep. That's about all we know at, at this point in time. But uh, I'll try to dive deeper into the literature when I have um, some time later this week or next week and try to get an answer about that. Yeah, that, that ability to heal um, is is so amazing and I you know I, I was just thinking about it uh, even just a couple of days ago about all the bears that we have around right now that at some point they had an injury that we went oh 
that's not good. I, you know, I don't know if that bear's going to make it. Or, you know, there was, as you mentioned, backpack. And um, Popeye had a severe leg injury back in 2006 or so, uh, where I, I wasn't sure he was going to make it. Um, well, 469, two 469, years yeah. And he uh, just showed up uh, <laughs> just once. He may not come back the rest of the summer because that seems to be his normal pattern. But. But we didn't see him at all last year, yeah. and and so, you know, you when when that happens after after a, an injury, the year before, we're thinking, well, maybe he didn't survive that, but in this case, he did. Uh, so really, really amazing. And you know what we ought to try to do if we can if we can get her is uh, Joy, who's doing that workout on on the coast with the project there, because she works at the at that. Um, that lab in Washington State, where they, okay. where they do some of this study about the metabolic rate of bears while in hibernation, and I don't know that she, if that, that that's her thing necessarily, but we might try to talk to her at some point. And it may not be a live chat because uh, matching our schedules up might be difficult, but we'll try to get some time with Joy and, and and see if we can get some answers to some of those questions later in the season. And we can't dive into all of the uh, specific stories of the bears that you're going to see. Um, so. Check out the ebook. You can read more uh, more examples of how certain bears have persevered persevered through the process. And and Mike gave you a, a web address for it. The other thing you can do is um, below the video, so down there yeah, somewhere. There's there's, there's, there's a little box that has uh, some quick links to various uh, websites, and one of those is for uh, ebooks or epubs. I can't remember exactly what it says, but that might be an easier way for you to get to it than typing in the URL. Uh, let's see. Um, we already mentioned that we have not seen any uh, spring cubs, right? Yes. Or did I just answer that in my head? We did. <laughs> okay. At least I, got, I think I did. So. We, we I have not seen any yet this year. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't some around, but with the camps going and so many people around already, I think if bears had shown up with spring cubs, we would know about it at this point. But they're on their way, I'm sure. We did earlier talk a little bit about courting behavior, mating behavior in bears, and what, what to look for in that perspective. But it, it does sometimes see like the female is trying to rebuff the advances of the male and people are wondering well why why do they do that why would a female not just you know, let a mate and get on with the business efficient um well who can say exactly what their motivation is and their thought process during this uh but um i would surmise that that uh, a part of it would be behavioral that the female is testing the male you know, uh, because uh, it's not just that she mates with necessarily the first male that crosses her path. You know, there's a, there's a, a process of selection from both sides that's occurring. So that's, uh, that's uh, potentially part of it. Um, what I'm not sure of, though, physiologically, um, it, would she be aware of her ability to successfully mate at that point, because uh, they, uh, if I recall, it's induced ovulation yeah, with with the bears, and so about whether they are induced ovulators or not. Yeah, what's the behavior that is triggering it, and is this extended courtship something that that will uh, initiate that process? Whether it it it's the only one, I don't know. I, that's another one we'll have to, yeah, we'll look, have to up. look it up. Sure. But uh, certainly, as a human watching it, uh, you would perceive it if I may be allowed for a moment as, uh, you know, playing hard to get for a while, testing and really making sure that that male is up, up to the task. I mean, she does lead him on quite a, a chase sometimes. But, uh, you know, what, what the female is actually thinking during that process, I'm sure we will never know. And from the male's perspective, too, um, you know, he, he only has a short window to maybe sire more offspring. Bears are promiscuous. The female may mate with several males, um, and the male, once he mates with her, is probably gonna during the mating season. If he catches uh, the scent of another receptive female who's going into estrus, he's probably gonna go follow her as well. So these big, really adult males, they got to take advantage of the situation while it's available to them, because they're not gonna be dominant throughout the rest of their life. As they age, there's always another bigger bear that's um, or a younger bear that's looking to push you out of the way. It's looking to get at the best fishing spot so they can grow larger, so they can compete for females in the future. Or maybe there's an up-and-comer that says, you know what, old-timer, this year it's my turn. You're not going to have this chance. So those adult males, they're going to be persistent in, in following the females because they, again, need to take advantage of the opportunities that are presented to them. It's not going to be there 
consistently from year to year? Um, we had a, a couple of questions. Um, well, actually, not a couple. We had a question about uh, fires. There was one question about fires. Well, there's been a small fire just a little bit to the north of the of the park, north and east of the, of this part of the park. Uh, outside the park, uh, it is mostly not you know, burning these days. It had a pretty good run uh, last week when it was hotter and drier, but we've had some rain over the weekend and cooler temperatures have kept it from spreading too rapidly. Uh, there are fires elsewhere in the state of Alaska, but uh, nothing that's that's going to be uh, at, at this moment affecting the bears of Katmai in any way, uh, pretty far off. We were seeing it on the cam sometimes, the smoke, but it, it, it wasn't a, a, a real issue of concern here. We've had a fairly dry month of June. Uh, but one of the things that prevents a lot of wildfires around here is just the lack of thunderstorms. Yep. We rarely have thunderstorms on the Alaska Peninsula. So sometimes we'll have them uh, during the hot days in the summertime, but it, uh, our uh, weather patterns here are different than what you're going to find in the interior of Alaska. So if anyone's visited Denali or gone to the Fairbanks area, the middle of the state has a lot more thunderstorms than we do around here. It's usually not nice like this. It's been nice this month, <laughs> right. but it's usually drizzly. We're usually worried about our camera fizzling from drizzle and, and, and damp weather. So this is, a, this is a nice day. I expect the weather to turn at any, any point in time. Humans would consider a great summer. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but the thing that's always in the back of our mind when we're, when we're enjoying these dry, sunny days is that this environment around here uh, is are, you know really adapted to these cold, wet maritime influences that that this area is known for. So when it gets really dry, we haven't had a substantial amount of rain. We'll see the sphagnum moss drying up. We might see reduced uh, berry crops that season. There'll be drought-related stress on trees, which can make them more susceptible to insect infestations. Uh, I mean, the the list just goes on and on and on forever. If you change something as fundamental about an area as temperature and rainfall, and uh, um, the fact that it's happening this one summer doesn't mean it's definitely, you know, climate change. But over the course of, of decades here, we are seeing uh, changes in in the in the climate uh, climatological records um, that that do indicate uh, increasing warmth. But uh, we certainly enjoy it when it's nice like this. But we also, uh, when it does start to rain like you did over the weekend, we go now. That's what it's supposed to do. That's what's right. <laughs> And uh, kind of one of the other questions in our queue here is um, more specifically about bear anatomy, and that's about their fat layer at the beginning of the season mm -hmm. and the end of the season. And, you know, how much fat do they carry at the beginning and at the end? Uh, as far as, like, a thickness goes uh, or under their no skin? no idea. I don't know. Yeah, I was wondering if you, if you knew. We know that they gain s several hundred pounds of fat. Uh, they can, even small sub-adult bears, they may double their weight actually uh, than Indy and she runs around like uh, like a lot of very young bears and she doesn't look that big right now uh, on the cam she's big on the ground when you're next to her she's still kind of a sizable bear she certainly weighs more than Roy and I uh, so she's uh, <laughs> uh, so she's a she's a sizable growing bear um, and but come you know she weighs uh, 200 pounds right now she may in the fall be 300 50, maybe sometimes in a good year, close to 400 pounds. So some of those younger bears will double their weight from early summer to the fall. Spring cubs are going to grow dramatically because they're only a pound when they're born. And then when they go to their dens, they may weigh as much, uh, as, much as 60 pounds or more. So they're growing at an exponential rate during their first that year. That first year, especially. And adult males, too. Uh, many hundreds of pounds they can gain. Uh, a, a big male like 747 or 856 or 814, they could be, you know, 800 pounds right now. They could be well over 1,000 pounds in the fall, just monster animals. One thing we might uh, try to do if we can get word to Grant. Grant uh, Hildebrand was the, the biologist that, uh, wildlife biologist for the Alaska region of the National Park Service. He's the one that helped us last year rescue Divot from the wolf snare. Um, he's doing some work on the coast of Katmai and Lake Clark right now where they are capturing some bears and then recapturing them at the end of the season. I know they'll be weighing them. It might be interesting to see if, if he can get his hands on some like fat caliper, calipers, you know, like, like, you know, when we assess our fat 
by pinching a layer. I don't. I can't imagine they can find a hunk of fat that they could grab and, and pinch. But maybe they do that sort of thing. But we could ask him for an estimate of of the thickness of the of the bear's fat at the end of the season. I made a, a couple other questions about sleeping bears. Where uh, are they vulnerable when they're sleeping from you know uh, from other bears maybe attacking them? Where do they happen to sleep? Yeah, well, uh, as we mentioned in the early part of the, the chat, the bears uh, in the Brooks Camp area will go and den on the mountains that, that ring this area. There's Mount Brooks, Mount Kales, Katolinat, Dumpling Mountain, um, Lagorse. Those are the primary denning areas for the bears that, that utilize this area. When they're in the den, probably their greatest threat is, is just the winter itself and the lack of food. But there have been uh, documented cases where bears have gone to other bears dens excavated them you know dug them out of the snow and then uh, have killed and eaten the the cubs that have been in those dens uh, so it does happen I I know uh, in particular of a case where a brown bear was digging up black bear dens uh, there are probably some um, instances where they've dug up brown bear dens as well so that's a possibility there but uh, I don't know that, that, that anybody would say that that's more common. Um, but you've been in a number of dens up on Dumpling. Uh, have you ever seen anything interesting in there? Like, there have was, you seen a dead bear in they're, one? They're bearing yeah. um, from, from virtually everything that I've seen. And there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of stories and um, evidence of bears that will maybe line the dens with things uh, like glasses. Uh, but I've... I've never seen anything like that in the bear dens that I've investigated here at Katmai. It's just just rocks and dirt at the bottom. Very clean smelling, actually. You, uh, if I was laying in a den over the course of the winter, I don't think it would smell very nice. But it mm -hmm. just smells like earth within, yeah. within the bear dens around here. So I've been in a in a den, if you will, of a bear with a dead bear in it oh, uh, really? in Ireland. Oh. <laughs> it's a cave. I can't remember the name of the cave, but in the in the burn part of. Um, of Ireland, there's a cave you can go to, and there is uh, a skeleton of a bear, might be from the Ice Age, I don't recall, just curled up, just died in its sleep inside the, inside its den, which was a, which was a cave. Um, uh, that was years ago. I don't remember the species of the bear or the age of it, but somebody could probably Google that and see. So we do know that it does happen. Sometimes they just don't survive the winter. Um, or at least that's suspected around here that they just don't make it out or they die shortly after coming out of the dens but uh yeah as mike said he hasn't seen anything he's been in a few dens other people have poked around in dens here and i don't know of anybody ever finding a, a skeleton in one or the remains and a, kind of another part of that question is where do, where do bears go to sleep um during the day or the night they're not going to return to dens to do that they're probably just going to fall asleep in a place that's comfortable that they're comfortable with and is comfortable for their bodies and that can be the same places sometimes from day to day. 410, for example, like Lily was mentioning earlier in the chat, last year she would pick naps on the other side <laughs> of Brooks Falls, other side of the river from us, quite frequently. And there's a lot of screen captures of that from last year floating around on the web. Uh, so sometimes they'll visit the same places. A lot of times they'll just go and wander and wherever they, when they feel tired, they'll just happen to lay down. But it, it just like with us, they want to be in a place that's comfortable where they're maybe free of disturbance. If you're a bear that's uh, maybe subjected to, a, not, I'm not going to say persecution, but a lot of competition from other bears, you're not going to sleep right next to Brooks Falls. If you're a younger seven-year-old bear, you're probably going to try to give those bigger males a little more space when you happen to be sleeping. Yep. Um, I have a backtrack question here for a second. Bobby, okay. if you're still watching us, uh, the river's pretty cold. We think it's about 50 degrees, but we think bears really like that cold temperature. Mike and I freeze to half to death when we go in it. You probably would too, but the bears on a sunny day like this probably enjoy that, that cold temperature at least a lot more than you and I would, would enjoy it. Um, we have um, just a few more minutes. Uh, for our hours. Yeah. We can try to get some to Well, there was one, one question here that I did skip over to make sure I got to Bobby's question, and that was, what is the most pressing environmental factor? That, and so uh, if, the, if the salmon run is less than they want, 
they will do their very best to eat something else. You know, they, they will adapt. And if you, if you think about the brown bear species as a whole, it uh, was found all around the, the northern hemisphere. In the United States, or North America, I should say, uh, it was found throughout much of Canada, uh, the western half of the United States, on down into even northern Mexico. It's a very, very adaptable species. But I think the thing that you could say that most negatively impacts their ability to survive is the loss of habitat because they can adapt to eating acorns versus salmon or eating um, you know animals they find dead on the on the prairie versus salmon or berries versus um, moths in the in the the high country of Yellowstone but if that habitat is gone if it's been developed if too many people are living in it and there are too many conflicts with those resources with people, that's something that they can't quite adapt to. And that's, I believe, why we don't see them in California, why we don't see them in Arizona. You know, it's, they, they couldn't coexist in increasingly smaller sections of, of, of habitat, suitable habitat for them. And um, that's one reason why Alaska and the Alaska Peninsula is so darn great for, for bears, at least at this point. Uh, there are more bears in the Alaska Peninsula than humans, um, which fortunately for us, they, they act independently instead of in packs. But you know, there are a lot more bears around. There's you know, 2,000 bears in the park right now, and there aren't that many people here today. Um, so that would be my take on it, is that that habitat uh, protection and preservation, whether it be in a national park, national wildlife refuge, or, or some sort of non-governmental refuge, uh, state lands, you know, those, those are the things that are really key to the survival of them. Yeah, they need room to roam. They need uh, an opportunity just to be bears. Uh, and we'll always have probably bears in Katmai, even if there were no salmon. But when we're talking about a phenomenon like Brooks Falls, like I mentioned before earlier in the chat, it's dependent on salmon. Without salmon, Katmai, and the survival of the ecosystem as we know it, really doesn't exist. Uh, so it, definitely salmon are, are the keystone of our ecosystem here. Uh, so if they have habitat available to them, they're going to survive. They're maybe not going to survive in the same way, though, without the fish that we have here right now. Yep. I would agree. Well, Mike, I think that's probably a good place to end it. Um, that's you know a really important question that we all need to ponder. You know what, you know what is the future of, of, of bears? What do we need to ensure that we have these magnificent magnificent species with us, you know, forever? Um, so probably a good place to end. I know there are a number of questions we didn't get to, but I b do believe we got to about 20 today, which is about the, the most that 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 we've ever been able to pull off. Our desire for this summer is to do more of these uh, chats with different subjects to start with, but always try to answer as many of your questions as possible. So if we didn't get to your question today, look for more of these in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll try to get a, a, a bit of a better schedule so that you'll have some more chats live. Uh, we, we do have the ability to get them posted on the YouTube channel later for you to, to watch at your, at your leisure. Uh, in addition to doing more of these chats, we have a, a new device with us this year. It's over here just out of view, and uh, we won't show it to you today, but we'll show it to you another time. But we have a mobile broadcast uh, wagon right now that we can wheel around and we can broadcast in different locations like the beach or, or the oxbow and give you a different perspective on, on the, the Brooks River phenomenon phenomenon than, than you're getting from the cams and in many cases even than you would get if you were visiting here. Uh, but we'll, we'll try to open up the park to, uh, to, to you more widely uh, in the coming weeks using that and um, we'll uh, try to keep answering questions and come on here and, and um, do these chats as much as we can. Yeah, so follow uh, Katmai's blog. You can find it on Katmai's website, nps.gov slash katm and I'll be putting stuff on there. Follow explore.org's blog as well about bears, and they'll be posting a lot of in interesting information there. Uh, both of those organizations, Katmai and explore.org, uh, we're on, on Twitter, uh, so you can find us uh, on, on Twitter. You can uh, find us on Periscope. We'll be experimenting with that um, sometime soon. Very soon. And Facebook and uh, Google Plus as well, too. So all of those different platforms, you know, you can pick your favorite. We'll, we'll try to utilize those as, as much as we can. Keep you updated on what's happening here on the cams and so yep. and if there's something you'd like for us to, to to think about doing go ahead and send us a, an email or or suggest it in the in the chat function sometime when you see us online like an idea for a for a location for a chat 
uh, and we'll see if we can make it happen. We want to we want to try to make this experience as ex because we know you all can't make it here. And uh, while we wish we could see you all firsthand, uh, technology is helping us bridge that gap, and, and hopefully we can you know help you make these meaningful connections to the park. Yeah, thanks to all the um, people at Explore.org who make these chats possible, and we'll talk to you next time. Yep, thanks for joining us. Bye now.